we have a bunch of visualization stuff under some of the Girl GAN project. Uh, there's a lot of different things going on. Uh, you can get involved in any aspect of it that is of interest to you. Uh, and I'll explain what those aspects are. So we're going to have an auto visualization EDA part of it. The purpose of this is to write tools which help people understand their data in a systematic way. So if you've done EDA before, like for a Kegel competition, you're probably looking at a bunch of kernels and asking, well, what did this person do? What does this person do? What does this person do? What does this person do? Part of the importance of automating something is it forces you to think in a recipe-like manner. What are all the things we need to do to do this regularly? And so, so the exercise of autoviz is not only good for writing useful software for people, because a lot of people may not know what to do. And so then the software can do it for them. It also allows you to decide, well, what's important? What do we need to do if it's important? And so this forms a, a, a way of being more rigorous and precise about a problem rather than treating every problem like a one-off thing where it's completely different than what you just did last week. Uh, this, will, this will require people doing basically research on, well, what do people do now for auto visualization? We already have a person in our computational skepticism class doing something on auto feature engineering and some visualization. But the first part of this will be coming up with a set of rules, essentially a recipe of what we want to do. Another thing is we want to package this into a library. This is primarily a software engineering thing. We don't want sloppy, terrible code. We want extensible, good code. We want the ability to just say, pip install go GAN, people can get access to it and integrate it with scikit-learn and with TensorFlow and with PyTorch and with everything else they're doing. We're also coming up with a data journalism database. What this means is we go on the web and we scrape images of what people have already done for real world data visualizations. What that allows us to do, and we already have a couple of robots which are beginning to do this. Um, it allows us to see what people do in the real world. It's what's called design. So there's a difference between making a graph and making a graph that effectively communicates an idea. That's the whole purpose of design. The design isn't, well, can I do a bar chart? We want a bar chart which really conveys an important message. That whole field is something called design. How do we make a website not just take email, but in such a way that people can use it effectively? And one way of doing that is looking at what professional designers do. So if you go to, for example, the New York Times, and look at their data journalism and look at somebody who did some Tableau thing, they often look very different, different. And that's because one of them has spent a lot of time on the design. The way we can learn about design is to see what designers actually do. What kind of charts they use for what kind of data? What kind of colors do they use? What kind of fonts do they use? All these kinds of things. And so uh, the way we do that is we just gather hundreds of thousands or even millions of actual data visualizations that people do. We begin to categorize. Further, we'll have an assessment of good ones based on the interactivity on social media. So for example, if somebody posts a data visualization on Twitter and it gets a lot of interaction, it sounds there's something interesting about that data visualization. So we want to, to see it. So for example, if I, if I do a bar chart, and we have an assessment of bar charts, but that people relate to well, you can just, just immediately just put in your, your image and it'll give you what a lot of bar charts that other people have made, which are similar to yours, which will give you ideas of, do I want to change my bar chart? Do I want to change the colors? Do I want to change the font? Do I want to change the scale? Those kinds of things. And this is, goes to the next one is auto design suggestions. So auto design suggestions are just, uh, this is what people generally do. You know, if they, they, these are the most common fonts used. These are, these are the color schemes used. These are the, 
Uh, and why that's important is, is for example, the people who are dyslexic or they're colorblind, they may not be able to see certain things. And often people just make a, a chart without really considering things like that. And so the, the, the design suggestion is saying, you can do a chart, it'll tell you, well, that's fine, but colorblind people aren't gonna see the difference here. You may choose to keep it the way you like it, or you may not, but at least you have that feedback. You, or that the dyslexic people aren't gonna be able to read your font. Or your font is too small for, for people with less than 2017 vision to read, or whatever it is. And that's what a design suggestion is. It isn't necessarily telling you what you should do, but just making you aware that there's some issues. Of course, if you're doing a data visualization for colorblind people, and you do a lot of charts that you know colorblind people can't read, well, that's just not very smart. But the purpose of the design suggestion tool is to, is to just automatically critique things, give you feedback on, on what it sees, and then, and then just literally make suggestions. Uh, we're also going to write a book on visualizing bias. Uh, pretty soon, in a couple of weeks, we're going to have a few examples of books written by students on model explainability and on model interpretability and on causal influence. And these are all written using Gitbook and similar tools. Um, there's also going to be one on visualizing bias. Visualizing bias is a big, big deal right now. And it can really help you get a job because every company is concerned about, are they being biased? Further, uh, the European Union started data laws, which actually prohibit companies from discriminating with data. California in 2020 adopted the same laws. Generally, when California adopts laws related to, to data, then that propagates to the rest of the US within a year or two. So right now, companies are scrambling to figure out how are they gonna handle this issue. And so if you develop expertise in it, it's a very desirable thing. Another thing is I teach game programming, uh, particularly through a tool called Unreal Engine. And so for those people who want, it'd be fun to do 3D visualizations. And I'll explain what this means. And finally, this is a, this is a research project. Hello. So you can, like, like was just mentioned, you can propose a particular research subject topic. And as long as it's related to visualization, then it fits within this project. If it's related to something else, it may fit in another project or it may be your own thing. But that was just discussed how to propose your own research. So what, is, what do we want with auto EDA? We wanna know which variables are important. We wanna know what data is missing. What are the best ways to impute the data? Should I do it on a, in a particular category or just take the mean or whatever? Uh, how to stratify data. And, and I won't go into detail what that means, but when we start talking about uh, co confounders, you'll understand that transforming data. Do I take something to a long scale? Why would I take something to a long scale? Do I need to normalize it? What should my scale be? On the, on the axes. Generally, we have uh, two axes in 2D and three axes in 3D. Unless we're doing animation, we typically don't support it. We wanna know, given this particular problem, what kinds of graphs are, are appropriate? I wanna compare this group versus that group. Well, what are my choices? I wanna look at time series data. What are my choices? Further, we wanna be able to rank visualizations, how interesting they are. Part of the problem with visualization, auto visualizations, is that we can potentially generate thousands of visualizations automatically. And humans can't look at thousands of, of, of visualizations. So they have to be presented the interesting visualizations first. And this is a research question. How, given two graphs, can we come up with metrics that, that indicate this is interesting and this is not? And once we can have a metric for indicating interestingness, related to a particular question, then we can sort them. 
or you rank them. This is all research. So some are logical, uh, some are psychological, some are empirical. So what does this mean, logical? For example, if we know we have time series data, we typically have certain kinds of charts we do. So it's fairly easy to detect whether on one axis is a some sequence, some measure of something coming after another, after another, after another. So we can do that. For example, geodata. If we know we have a longitude and a latitude, there are going to be certain things that we automatically want to generate, like bubble charts and floor plot maps. Um, we're going to primarily use this particular website. So we go to this particular website uh, that shows all these kinds of graphs. And then we can also look by function. So what are you trying to do? You're trying to make a comparison, You're trying to look at relationships. You're trying to look at a hierarchy. This will be part of our system. So what, what are we trying to figure out? And so it'll, it'll be some choices of graphs and given those graphs, why would we choose? So for example, we do comparisons. We still have quite a few choices. So we would want to make automatic suggestions and automatically create certain types of charts depending on, on uh, what it is. So this is kind of what they used to call an expert system. We're given a problem, it will come through a series of logical things, but we don't have to rely on purely expert system-like approaches. We can also look at empirical approaches. And that means empirical approaches and what do people actually do with this kind of data? And that's why the robot is so important. The robot is important because then we can determine what we can do. And sometimes what you want is if two charts are equivalent, sometimes you'd want to go with a more unusual chart because they'll stand out. I don't know if you guys have been looking at coronavirus charts, but you've probably seen a bazillion flattening the curve charts. After a while, you get tired of looking at them. And what stands out is something different. So these are the kinds of questions. Again, these are research questions. So you pick a question, what you want to do? I want to visualize time series. I want to visualize geographic data. I want to look at comparisons. I want to rank things. Or you might be interested in a particular type of chart. See, well, what can everything, something like this apply to? So for example, this has a cyclical nature and it's looking at comparisons in a cyclical nature. So that can apply to time series, seasonality, a bunch of stuff. And the way you do it is you do it. You try things, see, is it useful? Is it interesting? If it's useful and interesting, you can often write it up and send it to a conference, write medium articles on it, and then write code which incorporates it into the general software. Again, this is research. So it's not for me to tell you do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, but rather tell you sort of what, what are things that are interesting. And then you, you follow a particular path on that. Uh, looking at data is extremely important. You probably heard this garbage in garbage out there. Uh, it's true. So, and this is a big problem, particularly a big problem in data visualization. Uh, because a lot of people who are professional designers don't understand the math and statistics. So they often make pretty charts, but the charts are misleading because they simply don't understand sort of what is, what is going in. And no matter how pretty a chart you make, if it's garbage that you're putting in the chart, it's garbage that you're getting out of the chart. And so we want tools that, that not only data scientists can use, but information designers can use to understand their data. Most data visualization people, the people in a design school, just don't understand statistics, don't understand any of this stuff. And so often they make charts which are very misleading, and this is a big issue. It's a big issue because we live in a world where it's so easy to publish stuff and make websites and make things. And sometimes they take off, but sometimes 
things that are just blatantly wrong take off. And so we want tools that allow people who don't necessarily have a deep training to understand what it is that they're actually looking at. Um, and so there's all kinds of things we can look at. We can visualize what's on the web, the source. We can visualize network flow. We can wire causal dependency. We can do interpretability, bias, what features are important. Um, it's, a, there, it's just a vast, vast project that can go on and on and on and on. So for example, here we're, we're visualizing stationarity. The problem with a plot like this is it takes a fair amount of statistical sophistication to understand what you're looking at. So plots that can say the same thing. So what th these plots are essentially saying here is that China is stationary and Italy and the US are not. Well, what's the interpretation of that? Well, the interpretation of that, and this is for COVID data, is that in the US, the COVID thing might actually be multiple COVID things. Like what's happening in New York may be very different than what's happening in Kansas. But most people will not be able to discern that without a lot of training by looking at those three charts. So other kinds of visualizations which can convey that to people, that idea would be great. And of course it's research. I don't necessarily know the solution to that. This is the standard way of looking at things like the correlation, the autocorrelation, the trend, the stationarity of them. But maybe there are other ways we can take the same info, the same statistical info, and convey the meaning to, to, to somebody who doesn't necessarily have the training in looking at time series data. Then feature selection, um, it's a fairly standard thing. This happens in almost all our projects. Generally, we want to know whenever we look at any data, whether that's for visualization or for that's a model, which features are important. Then this can get more facilitated how they are important, why they're important. Uh, here's something I did. This was very early on in the, in the COVID thing, like around late May. Even in late May, it was obvious that New York was an issue. And this was before people were talking about New York. So visualizations like these can help sort of gain insight on data. Uh, these are what are called partial dependency plots and uh, ICE plots, decision trees. Uh, what this allows one to do is for certain types of things, it isn't just this is important, but this is important after a threshold. So for example, it probably doesn't do any good if only 5% of the population wears masks. There's probably a point where 20, 30, 40, 50 people, 50% 50 of the population has to wear a mask before it really even has any kind of an effect. And that's what these kinds of plots tell you. They tell you it doesn't really matter, it doesn't really matter until it hits this threshold. And then it goes up and stop. And again, after a while, once 70% of the population wears masks, it may not matter if any more wear masks. And so this is what a plot like this would tell. Again, this will be integrated with other projects which are already doing stuff like this. Um, again, we talked about the autocorrelation and the stationarity and this data. Also, people sometimes have weird, interesting charts. This was just something I found on a website. They're looking at the proportions. I find this one a little hard to read. Like I couldn't tell you this one was equal to this one without the number. This is 2300. But it, it does attract the attention. It has the benefit of, of being unusual and does convey rough proportions. I do think it's a little lacking because this one doesn't look three times as large as this one to me. And so without the number, I wouldn't be able to tell that. Um, but still, you could play with stuff and see is this interesting, or maybe this kind of thing would be interested in, interesting in some other domain and really useful in some other domain. Um, there's also a lot of techniques people use. Uh, we won't go over into these, um, but for example, 
multiple dashboards are very common. They're very common, I think, because of the software, because everybody sort of uses Tableau or Power BI. So then everybody produces dashboards. The problem with that is the dashboard will often do a lot of stuff for you and do stuff by default. And they'll be, they won't have the impact that they could because they look like every other dashboard. Um, but that's what, um, there's also a lot of psychological information about how people read things, what people can see and what people can't see. So maybe down the line, we can look at the data and say, well, making curves and angles is more effective for more people than doing dots and things like that. But there's some research in how people perceive things. And there's a belief that certain kinds of things like shading and stuff like that is more effective than other kinds of things. But again, this research, uh, the good thing about this is, this is all just sort of proposed from psychological literature and has been around there for a long time. This is 1984, that this was proposed, but nobody's ever actually validated it. Meaning looking at real world things and saying, do people actually read this better than they read that? And this is the same thing, just look at that. Uh, we won't talk about that. Um, we wanna do some feature engineering. So for example, if we look at this feature here, you've seen these charts a lot. This is an engineered feature. This is simply the confirm minus the deaths minus recover. But this is often an effective way of viewing something where that sort of looks like the rest of them. I can immediately tell and the reason why it is is because what we really care about is not not how many people get sick but how many people are dying and how, what is the rate so if everybody got sick and then everybody recovered the next day we wouldn't really care whether a thousand or a million people got sick but if but if you know ten thousand people are getting sick a day and only a hundred recover a day then we care about that. And that's what that chart tells you. Uh, we want to look at uncertainty. We want to look at sort of equations. We want to look at log scales and things like that. Maybe even using things like GANs to generate art. Uh, this is very effective visually, I think. Concept maps, this is a measure of, of uncertainty, ways of looking and viewing at uncertainty. There's a lot of different kinds of uncertainty, statistical uncertainty, knowledge uncertainty, other kinds of uncertainty. So this is again, a research project. How do we visualize uncertainty? It could be a book as well, and several medium articles. Maybe you look at that. Okay, uh, we want an open source library. So what we want is uh, we're gonna start with a library called AutoViz, which is under Apache 2 license. Uh, that means uh, that we can do whatever we want with it. Our license will also be Apache 2, which means you guys can do anything you want with it. So if you work for a company and wanna use some of these things, you can. Wanna start your own company and use these things, you can. There's really no restrictions on it. Uh, but what this requires, this aspect of the, of the project requires real software engineers. People can write good code, testable code, maintainable code, can package the library in such a way that we can say conda install, go GAN, pip install, go GAN, and everything just works for people. We also want an extendable because people are gonna keep on adding new things and new things and new things and new things. So for the open source library, we're really looking for hardcore software engineer people. People know object oriented programming and unit testing and real software engineers. Data journalism database. We've already gotten started on this and we have a, the beginning of a couple web tools. It turns out that Google, we can ask Google say, find us heat maps and it will, which actually makes our life really easy. Uh, which potentially could get us hundreds of thousands. We're just gonna collect a lot of data and where they're from and then start analyzing the, the, the database. We're also gonna make the database publicly uh, downloadable. It's gonna be available through a website as well. So people can search, okay, 
show me heat maps, show me, uh, show me a bubble chart, show me this, show me that, or the ability just to stick in an image, to find things similar to that. Um, and then this will be a basis of grant writing because the good thing about uh, open source databases is they, once you get a grant for them, they'll typically indefinitely renew those grants because they'll keep, if they think it's a valuable resource, to keep it going and keep it going and keep it going. Uh, we're going to do a website. The website is going to be a portal. And basically what that means is just a place for people who are interested in, in to share and post things. Sort of kind of like a news feed or Reddit. You know, just, oh, I found this really cool article on this or what do you think about this visualization or this or that? It'll have online versions of the tools. So we want the ability to do some of this analysis for people who, for example, can install Python and can't use Python. And then we want the data journalism database, both as a download an API and uh, just searchable via the web for the website. So this is a project for the web dev people, for the full stack people. And, and this is research because I don't know the best way to do a portal. I can look at portals that I like. Well, I think Reddit is nice and I think this is nice and that is nice. But then we want to try them and see what works, what actually gets people. Because a portal doesn't really work if people don't discuss on it. A portal works well if people are constantly sharing interesting stuff they find related to data visualization. Portal doesn't work if people start spamming it and doing all sorts of buy Viagra and all this kind of stuff on the portal. So that all includes research and spam filtering and this and that and all that. So this is real research, but it's really research set for the, 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 the full stack people, the web people. Uh, we want an auto design tool. The simplest auto design tool would be to take an image to find a bunch of similar images that you think come from reputable sources, like the New York Times, The Economist, da, 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 and then show people related images. That way somebody sticks in their visualization and they get you know, 10 or 20 or 100 visualizations from top designers, which are trying to do sort of a similar thing, give them a bunch of ideas. More sophisticated tools will look at the image itself and look at the font, look at the colors, look at this, and say, you know, you have too many colors. Uh, people with this kind of eyesight are going to be able to see that. Um, those kinds of things. Your font is too small, your font is too big, you have, uh, you're not using enough negative space, you just have too much there. But that's more long term. The, the most simple design tool is literally sticking in, you know, you do some visualization and, and in Python or in Tableau, you export as an image and you just say, well, find me similar stuff that's done by people who do this for a living. And then it allows you to see, that's often how design is done, right? You find stuff that you like to give you ideas. And all that really means is looking at the similarity between images. And then of the other images to rank them, the simplest way to rank images that we get from the real world is from the source. Basically, the New York Times doesn't hire people to do their data visualizations who don't have a lot of experience in it. So in general, most of their visualizations are pretty well designed. Same for The Economist, same for a lot of big things. And then, um, and so one could just, you know, just uh, a tool like that is, is, even though it's fairly simple to build, is really useful. If I want to design a car, I would want to look at other kinds of cars I like. I would say sports cars or trucks or whatever it is. So that's, that's a thing. Uh, we're going to write a book uh, on visualizing bias. This is a big deal these days. So how do we do this? So a few of the skunks in, in future things are going to talk about their books when they're written. We're going to have at least a couple, at least initial books done in, by the end of by August 15th. I think at least three, maybe four or five. And they'll, they can talk about Gitbook and all these kinds of things about how do I write a book like that. And we can look at their books and do that. But basically what we do is you do research. 
you, you ask, well, what are people doing to visualize bias? And you start compiling it. Okay, these people are using this technique. 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 And then we start organizing those techniques. So, okay, these techniques only work on neural networks. These techniques only work for, you know, these kinds of cases. These techniques require you knowing a discriminating class or whatever. Um, so we begin to organize them. And then it's very important in a book not to be overly theoretical. Meaning we want contrary examples of how do we do this? How do we, how, how, because that's what most people reading a book like this want. They're reading a book because they want to know how do, how do I visualize bias on my data? So having some, some hands-on examples of some data sets, these things being done is great. And of course, this is research. So what will often happen is once you see some ideas, you may like idea, but you think, well, I could improve that a bit. So maybe I'll do this, but I'll, rather than a bar chart, I'll use this kind of chart because I think it's more effective. Or uh, I can extend that by changing this or changing that. That's what research is. Most research is extending and tweaking what exists. It's very rare that you, you, anybody does anything purely, completely novel that nobody's ever thought of before. And so the, the race, research typically works is you first, well, what are people doing now? Um, this is also really nice for students because of two things. One is three years ago, nobody was visualizing bias. And so you're not like at a big disadvantage of somebody who has 30 years experience in the industry doing this. Two is you're unlikely to, to be able to take a course anywhere in the world, Harvard, MIT, or anywhere on visualizing bias. So there, this, it would be very rare to come out of a master's program and have some expertise in this. But if you work on this, you will have some expertise. And you can show that by the work that you do. And this is extremely, extremely, extremely hot field for pretty much every company that deals with data, which is basically every company. With, with a lot of social justice stuff going on in the world and people claiming unfairness and discrimination and this and that, more and more pressure, not only just ethical pressure, but legal pressure, laws requiring companies to show that their algorithms don't discriminate. Some of them are already here. Every company in the world knows this is coming. Whether it's in two years, five years, whatever. And they know they need to get a handle on this and they don't know how to get a handle on this for, by and large. So if you have some experience in it, it just moves you to the front of the line terms of getting a job because most of the people in the company will not know how to do this even though they, they may have been working on statistical models for the last 20 years so so that's that's the idea again you'll have a better sense of how the books are written when we go through some books that have been written and uh, some are already online I, I requested students who are willing to 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 allow their things to be shared, to send that to me. But it, on August 15th is a hard deadline, meaning uh, all the people who've been writing books this summer need to get something written on the 15th. So minimally on the 15th, we'll be able to show people some stuff, even if it's not perfect. And speaking of perfect, the idea isn't for everything you do to be perfect, but to do as you best you can and then get stuff out there which is good and well thought and well researched. Not, nothing you ever do will be perfect. And so if, if you're waiting for something to be perfect before you show something, you'll never show anybody anything.
3D visualization. So let me just give a quick example of what this might look like. This is something called Unreal Engine, which we teach in the uh, virtual uh, thing. I might start a group within Skunk Works for just game stuff. So we'll just meet once every two weeks and you learn how to make a game. So you don't have to take that class in order to learn how to make a game. But the power of this, these game engines and the game engines realize this is not just for games. It's for real world problems. For example, I could make a real building in Unreal and have people do virtual tours of a real building. They have them now for flight simulators and car simulators and all this kinds of stuff. Some called real time 3D. But this can also be used for visualization. So here's a nice little example of it. The person in the map theme in delivering the weather forecast is a dinosaur. Because we talk about the weather all the time with these esoteric terms, sometimes it's very confusing. If you can show it, you can communicate it. Immersive mixed reality allows us to take any weather story we want and put the on-camera meteorologist into the... So everything in the background was done in Unreal Engine. those environments. We wanted to launch in a very memorable and bold way. We wanted to make a statement that we were transforming weather presentation. We took the viewer through a real-time journey as if a tornado was approaching our headquarters, the Weather Channel. The reaction was, was immediate. The studio went to bars and tone, the camera dropped, you know, and it goes to commercial to try and gather our thoughts. That was an awesome thing. When we were watching the Twitter feeds, people were like, oh my God, what's happening over there? The Future Group really has been our partners in this whole process and, and learning this new technology. So again, we teach this, uh, I teach this in the classes. You don't have to do the class necessarily depending on interest, but I can set up a sort of once every two weeks, essentially what we did in the class, how to get started with these tools. You could, for example, do a visualization of a virus from the virus's perspective. That's not something you can do with any of these other tools. You could do real simulations. You could do a game. A game stop the virus. And you could make decisions on how much you shut things down and how much you open things up and how much you do this and how much you do that and have people play the game. It's, it's, it's going to completely change graphics and visualization. To do this would require you learning the tool. Learning this particular tool would take you three, four months to, to get to the level at which you could do this kind of stuff. Uh, whether we do these classes or not, it'll really depend on the interest, whether there are people who are interested in this or not. Um, but it's, it's very powerful stuff and there are not really a lot of people with the skills to do this. So again, that makes you, makes you very attractive from a marketing perspective of getting a job. Jane, being able to take these amazing graphics and actually broadcast them. The Weather Channel is a great client. They're not afraid to take chances because they want. So, um, so that's what that thing is about. It's a sort of a separate thing. It's basically using two tools, Unreal Engine and Houdini, to, to do stuff. It's also where you could do animations. You could just like do regular graphs, like bar graphs, but you could see them change over time fairly easily. And also have people interact with them. That's the, the big difference in the game versus film, is in, in a game, I can give it input and it will change based on that input. So I can do a visualization of sort of the spread of a virus, I can change something and see, okay, now what does the virus spread look like? Again, it's very technical. Um, it would take most of you a, a bit to get up to speed to be able to do this, but half the people in this summer's class are, are using Unreal Engine and they're all producing stuff after say week four but to get really good at it, it would probably take you a good three, four months. 
class and fairness, big, big deal. So for example, this exact same text, but they put as a predictor whether the person is a male or a female. Same bio, exact same bio. And then uh, when they said this was a female, they predicted this person's a teacher. When they said the person was a male, it predicted he was an attorney or she was actually, it's a she, this is Melinda Gates bio, is an attorney. Um, so what is bias? Bias is when the probability of something given, so it's unbiased. If the probability of me getting a job did not depend on my race or my gender, then that would be unbiased. If the probability of getting me a job is significantly changed by my race, then that's bias. Bias becomes discrimination when that thing is protected. And what does that mean? So the probability of somebody dying from COVID is much greater if they're older. But that's not considered discrimination because there's a biological basis for that. If they couldn't get into a college because they're older, that would be discrimination. Because there's no reason somebody older can't do work that somebody younger can do in terms of intellectual work, doing homework assignments and this and that. And so uh, this is a very, here's, here's a visualization of bias. They looked at some verb vectors and they conditioned sort of what's, what's close to it. So some things make sense. When it's he, it would predict brother, she, sister. Here's a little bias, nurse, doctor, homemaker, programmer. And, and so um, the fact that it says pregnancy when it's a she sort of makes sense because only women can get pregnant. But if, if you consider somebody a homemaker with all the same input, if it's a woman and a programmer, they're a male, then that's a way, one, one of many ways to possibly visualize bias. Again, this is a hot, 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 hot topic right now. Because every company has to deal with this, every single one. Any company that uses data is coming under increasing pressure to show that they don't discriminate with that data and in their AI. Um, and, and so this is, you know, the part of, we can look at various things. You can also do your own research. So this is a nice little thing that CMU did. So what CMU did is they, they looked at things like percentage of doctor visits uh, that, that you said people had COVID and they looked at the relative frequency of COVID related to Google searches to estimate how many. It turns out these things were very highly correlated. Why is that important? Well, there's bias in the way we get data. So first of all, if, if we could look at something like a Facebook survey or Google Trends, and get the same information we do from a doctor's office, i.e. it correlates perfectly or nearly perfectly, it's a lot easier to get Google trend data and Facebook survey data than it is doctor office data. Further, every source of data that we have is biased. So even though we would generally trust a doctor's office, whether if a doctor said this person trusted at COVID, more, Certain people don't go to the doctor. Uh, in the US, there's a fairly high percentage of people who don't have medical insurance. Those people don't tend to see doctors. There are people who are undocumented and other things. Those people don't tend to see doctors. So, so we can get at the same thing with different indicators. In fact, these, these shots that you have are no longer up on the CMU website. Now they just say real-time COVID estimates. The reason why they believe it's real time is they, they've shown that these things like, like Facebook surveys and Google Trends correlate very well with stuff that they trust more. 
like actual positive COVID tests. This is research. And so that's, that's something to do. This is one of an infinite source of things that you possibly could do. Um, so these are, these, these are the projects uh, that are currently going on within Gauguin. And Gauguin is basically an umbrella for data visualization research. So at this point, does anybody have any questions? So, uh, so Professor, we'll take the questions in the Q and A session, um, yeah. and let's see how it goes. Then. Okay. So then, just move on to the the next thing. Awesome. Uh, thanks a lot, Professor. So uh, that was a great um, knowledge that we got from what the project is all about. So, so I hope uh, all the attendees today got enough idea what Gugan project is and what Autovis is uh, dealing with and what kind of uh, skills we need. Uh, to go ahead with it. Similar to the way we just explained what Autovis is, there will be in coming weeks the rest of the projects being explained here.